Yes. I, it's, once you throw in Charlie Brown Christmas, then it becomes a party for everyone. So I will be here. My, 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 my older children, and I mean, my, we're gonna, all the Caulfields that still live in Brownsville are going to be here. So we hope to see you. And yes, there's a big old surprise at the end that you don't want to miss. So it's a party for everyone. Uh, hope, hope, you, hope you make it. 6.30 this Tuesday. So today's so two days from now. Okay. And then our final big event for the Christmas holiday is our Christmas Eve service. We have done Christmas Eve services for 10 years. Uh, but uh, this is going to be our, our biggest, our most elaborate. We're going to have, um, I don't think anything of, any of this is a secret. I think I can tell you we're going to have a live nativity scene. We're going to have a children's booth. We're going to have um, treats, refreshments. We're going to have a photo booth. I think I'm forgetting one thing, but that's all before the service. And then the service will start, and it is just this simple, warm reading of the Christmas story and singing of the Christmas carols. So we read a little bit, and we sing a little bit, and we read a little bit, and we sing a little bit. And, and one of our families, one of our River Church families is going to, as a family, they will be our readers, and then you'll go home with your heart warm, your heart full, and you will, um, you will stay home Christmas morning, and I am going to send you something via email that will aid you as a family to have your own worship there um, at home on Christmas morning. So we'll have our late, it's not late, but our, our Christmas Eve evening service, and it'll be a big old blowout, and then you'll go home, and then I'm going to email you something that will aid you in your, in your family worship on Christmas uh, Sunday morning. So that is, I believe, everything that's going on. Um, Pastor Billy's going to preach for us today, so I'm, I'm going to just sit and soak and enjoy. So I look forward to that. But as he's making his way up here, before we, before we move into that, would you stand and say hi to someone around you? Let's stand and do that. Good, uh, good morning. Good morning. You know, Randy, Randy said, uh, I don't even know why I'm saying this, but I'm going to say it. <laughs> Randy said that we're going to have a huge blowout uh, on Christmas Eve. It's going to be a big service, huge blowout. And so normally that's a good thing unless you have little kids and you associate blowouts with something completely different. And so <laughs> we, uh, we just have a little girl, so been happening. Um, we're excited. <clears throat> um, are you ever in a situation that you don't want to be in? <laughs> now, talking about blowouts, obviously, that's, that's that situation, which that has nothing to do with the sermon, but are you ever in a situation that you don't want to be in? A situation maybe where your heart starts to feel a little bit uneasy. Uh, it starts to race a little bit. You know, your, your palms start to get a little sweaty. <clears throat> situation where uh, if you know you're about to be in this situation or in this circumstance, you hope uh, that the time just goes as slow as possible to prevent you from going into that situation. Uh, and, and as you wait, the time seems to go quicker and quicker. You know, the holiday season is coming up, and many of us spend time 
with some of our family that we haven't seen uh, and maybe some friends that we haven't seen and just this idea of, of being in a situation that you don't want to be in is, is a situation that we often find ourselves in, especially during this time of the year. Um, perhaps the idea of getting together uh, with family, uh, again, is causing tension inside your heart. And many of us, unfortunately, will find ourselves these upcoming weeks in situations and in circumstances that we don't want to be in. <clears throat> in fact, some of us are already in those situations. I know for myself, I am. <laughs> I, uh, I am a middle school coach and teacher. And those of you who are teachers, you can probably relate to what I'm about to tell you guys. But uh, every day after lunch, I have that class. Uh, it is the class <laughs> that drives me nuts. Um, it's, 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 it's that one class where you're having a great day, and, and then as you go through that class, it could, it, could, it could just throw a wrench in your entire day. It's a class that really tests my patience. It's a class that makes my lunch just before that really unenjoyable. <clears throat> uh, it started off as a great class, but, it, uh, it, you know, schedule changes and whatnot, I've got... Uh, some students added to the class that have really, really tested my patience. And, and on my worst days, I wish that I could get out of that situation, out of that circumstance. I wish things could go back to the way that they were before. I hope that the, the circumstances uh, of my situation would change. <clears throat> However, I'm not convinced that that's the answer. I'm also not convinced that that's what Jesus would mostly want for us. You may have heard this at times, uh, plenty of times uh, at River Church. I know Pastor Randy has said it. I have said it. Um, Jesus isn't mostly concerned about your circumstances. He's mostly concerned about your heart, right? He's, he, he's mostly, uh, not mostly concerned about our circumstances, what's going on around us, but he's mostly concerned about what's going on inside of us. We find ourselves <clears throat> in, in these less than ideal circumstances and immediately uh, we want out. And I believe that the Bible teaches that our less than ideal circumstances to be in are our most ideal circumstances to share the love of Jesus in. I want to repeat that. I believe that the Bible teaches that our less than ideal circumstances to be in are our most ideal circumstances to share the love of Jesus in. We're going to look at that this, this morning. <clears throat> Before we do that, let's, let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for this day. I thank you that we get to come together and worship you and study your word, Lord. Uh, as we go through this sermon, as we study your word, as we see what the Bible teaches about this, Lord, I pray that you just bring those circumstances that drive us nuts. I pray that, pray that you bring those to the forefront of our mind. Lord, I pray that you would guide us and lead us to examine not only our circumstances, but also our hearts. And may the Lord, may you shape us through your word into your image for your glory, Lord. I pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> Today we're going to look at the story of Noah. And the story of Noah is found in the early chapters of Genesis. Noah finds himself in one of these situations. In the story that we're going to look at today, everything around him, right? He was in a, in a, in a difficult situation and, and everything around him had changed, but the problem wasn't fixed. 
We're going to uh, be in Genesis chapter. So the story of, of Noah goes from Genesis 6 to Genesis 9. We're going to be uh, not in all of that. We're going to read a few pieces of this, of this, uh, of this passage, and, and we'll fill in the rest. But I want to start in Genesis ch- uh, uh, chapter 6, verses 5 through 13. <clears throat> you know what? I'm going to read this from my Bible. I brought my Bible, so I might as well read it. Right? <clears throat> 5 through 13. The Lord saw how great the wickedness was of the human race. Um, I'm sorry. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. The Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth. His heart was deeply troubled. So the Lord said, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race I have created. And with them, the animals, the birds, and the creatures that move along the ground. For I regret that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Verse 9. This is the account of Noah and his Family. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked faithfully with God. Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become, for all the people on earth had corrupted their ways. So God said to Noah, I'm going to put an end to all the people For the earth is filled with violence because of them. I am surely going to destroy both them and the earth. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So from here, we see that the earth is filled with wickedness, right? And so so God comes to Noah and he says, I'm going to destroy the whole earth but I'm going to save you and your family, right? And so I need you to build this boat. Uh, I need you to get you and your family in the boat, get all the, 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 the animals into the boat, and we're going, to, we're going to take care of the human race. And so that's what happens. Uh, again, you're familiar with the story. It rained for uh, 40 days and 40 nights. Uh, we went to Austin, Black Friday, uh, and it was raining for four hours. And I was just done with it. I was so like nervous of just getting in a car accident. Could you imagine 40 days and 40 nights uh, of rain? <clears throat> right? But, but, but all that happens, everything on the earth is destroyed. Noah and his family uh, is, is saved. And, and, and I want to pick up the story in Genesis chapter 8, verses 20 uh, and 21. It, it reads, Then Noah built an altar to the Lord, and taking some of, the, uh, of all the clean animals and clean birds, he sacrificed burnt offerings on it. Verse 21, The Lord smelled the pleasing aroma and said in his heart, Never again will I curse the ground because of humans, even though every inclination of the human heart is evil from childhood. What a story. What a story. <clears throat> I came across this passage a few weeks ago. I was, I was, I was reading uh, through the Bible, doing a, a Bible do- devotional, and, and I came across this passage, and it was through the whole story of Noah, and as we got to that passage, I was shocked. Uh, my, my jaw nearly dropped. Right? I, I, I expected there to be a resolution to the problem. I expected the, the evil uh, of, of, of all of us, the evil of humanity wiped away, and I expected there to be a resolve. And what do we see at the end of it? It says, I will never again curse the ground because of humans, even though every inclination of the human heart is evil from childhood. The flood did not fix the problem. The flood happened 
and the sin was still there. The, circumstance, uh, the circumstances changed, but the problem remained. How devastating. <clears throat> Many of us are looking for a changed circumstance, a fresh start. But all too, often, all too often what happens is once that changed circumstance happens, shortly afterward we find ourselves in the same or in a similar situation. <clears throat> you see, the discouraging thing about my sixth, uh, my sixth grade class is that I've had classes like this before. If you're a teacher, uh, again, you know what I mean. You, you, you'll hold your breath through the semester or through the year, and, and, and you'll just hope to get and wait to get a new group of students. But oftentimes for me, what I found is the problem just continued to resurface. This repeated reality causes me to shift my focus. Instead of focusing on my circumstances, I am forced to look inside. These circumstances, the less than ideal circumstances in our lives, are coming. How can I respond uh, differently? What am I doing? How can I make the best of the situation? You see, the thing, uh, uh, what happened in the <clears throat> story of Noah's, the flood didn't fix the problem. The, fun, the, the, the flood put the microscope on the problem. Right? The problem is uh, <clears throat> our hearts are evil continuously all the time. Again, these circumstances are coming. How can, how can I respond differently? Often our less than ideal circumstances, I said this earlier, our less than ideal circumstances to be in are our most ideal circumstances to share the love of Jesus in. So, so think about your life. Again, we, we've talked about this. You've had some time to think. But what are those pressing circumstances in your life right now there are difficult things that you are walking through what is a circumstance that you're hoping that God changes I have them I know you have them we have them but again God isn't mostly concerned about changing our circumstances he's mostly concerned about changing our hearts. <clears throat> Much like Noah's situation, our circumstances reveal our hearts. The fact that the flood didn't fix, uh, the, didn't fix the problem, didn't fix the circumstance, begs the question, what will, my heart, uh, what will, ch what will change my heart from a heart of evil, of self-interest, of my own desires... What will make that change? We can't just get rid of it. We have to deal with it. And that's the beauty of this story. The story pushes us. This moment pushes us to the story of Jesus. Only Jesus can give us a new heart. Only Jesus can turn that, uh, a heart that is focused on evil, on self-interest, on self-preservation, on me, on myself, into a heart that is focused on Him, that is focused on righteousness, that is focused on walking in a way that is pleasing to the Lord. Only Christ can give you a new heart and a new mind. Only Christ can fix our heart issue. <clears throat> If you haven't uh, responded to the call of Jesus in your life, I would encourage you to do so this morning. I pray that the Lord would give you a new heart this morning. Turn from your ways and turn to Jesus. 
I pray that He would change the inclination of your heart from one that is pursuing evil to one that is pursuing Him. I pray that you respond to Jesus' call in your life today. Again, entrusting Jesus calls us to turn from our ways and to follow Him. I pray that. I pray that on you, on your life today. Uh, but as we have a new heart, <clears throat> and we are being transformed into the image of Jesus, I understand that most of our circumstances will not change. So this, the, the things that are pressing on you, the things that are um, keeping you up at night, the things that are making you feel uneasy, the reality is most of those circumstances will not change. So the question becomes, how do we deal with them? What do we do moving forward? There are two ways I want to answer this. First, um, we're well, well, going back to the, 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 the overarching point of our service today. I want us to look at how our less than ideal circumstances uh, can actually uh, uh, be our ideal circumstances. And we'll do this in two ways. First, we'll take our lead from Jesus. He was born, our Christmas season, he was born in less than ideal circumstances circumstances and I'm, and I'm referring uh, to more than just the you know the, the manger scene <clears throat> and from there we'll explore uh, some practical ways in which you can deal uh, with the circumstances in your lives in my, in my lives in my life in our lives so first how is Jesus birth a less than ideal circumstance Again, it involves more than just the location of his birth. Right? Jesus, he was going to be hated. He was going to lead 12 followers that were really difficult to lead. He was going to be betrayed by one of them. His people, right, his, 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 the Jewish people were going to have him uh, uh, turned over to the Roman officials to be killed, to be murdered, to be hung on a cross. Right? It was a less than ideal circumstance, a less than ideal situation for Jesus to come into the world. We're going to look at two uh, examples just briefly Isaiah chapter 53 says and this is again this is the Old Testament I think this is 700 years uh, 800 years uh, before Jesus was born it, it, it prophesies about him it says he was despised and rejected by mankind a man of suffering and familiar with pain like one whom people hide their faces he was despised and we held him in low esteem, right? We did not care about him. If you go on to read the rest of this passage, it's a very famous passage. But basically, Jesus was, was <clears throat> led to the slaughter, right? <clears throat> uh, John 1 says, uh, The true light, Jesus, that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him. I'm sorry, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, his own people, but his own did not receive him. Jesus knew this and was coming into this less than ideal circumstance. Right? If I'm God... And, I, and I'm getting ready to send a, a Jesus, right, God the Son, my Son, into the world. I'm waiting for, like, prime, uh, prime circumstances, right? I want to make sure he's around some solid people. Uh, I want to make sure that, 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 that he's, he's able to, uh, to gather a team, his disciples, of legit, strong, hard-working men. Uh, the, the people that he's going uh, to, I want them to quickly recognize who Jesus is and follow him and support him, right? If, if I'm God, that is the circumstance that I want to send Jesus into. 
Thankfully, I'm not God. Um, I'm waiting for a more opportune time. I'm waiting for favorable circumstances. That's not what Jesus did, though. Right? These less than ideal circumstances were the absolute ideal circumstances for Jesus to come to the world. Magnified his love so much more. John 3 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son. Right? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, to destroy the world, to wipe everybody out, but to save the world through him. In love, Jesus came. A situation that we would run from, Jesus entered into. In a situation where we would hate, Jesus loved. This poor circumstance was the ideal circumstance for his love to shine brightly. <clears throat> now this is the blueprint for how we should engage in our circumstances. Right? We, we, we need a change of heart. Now what I'm not saying, and Pastor Randy mentioned this last week, but what I'm not saying is that we need to love our circumstances. Right? We don't necessarily need to love the circumstances, but we are called to love in our circumstances. The circumstances, the miserable circumstances, the, the, the less than ideal circumstances that we find ourselves in, we're not necessarily called to love those circumstances, but love while we are in those circumstances. We need to pursue love in our circumstance. I know it sounds completely counterintuitive, but that's what Christ did, and that's what he called us to. <clears throat> so the first thing, how should we engage in these difficult situations? Trust the Holy Spirit to give us the ability to love. Right? We must ch uh, choose to love through those situations. It's what Christ did and what it is what we are called to do. Now, it's interesting. There is something about uh, love that has an effect on ourselves and also how, how we... <clears throat> um, and, and, and so, so love... Let me start over. Um, <clears throat> so there's an interesting thing about love. Right? Love has the ability to not only change ourselves, but change those around us. <clears throat> so first I want to look at a, a, an illustration uh, a, a, about our, ourselves. And so um, the, the, this group that I'm about to talk about is not necessarily a Christian group uh, uh, of people, but it is a people uh, who are choosing love in their circumstances. And so some of y'all know this. Again, I'm a coach, and, and, and I played sports. I, 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 I played sports my whole life. In high school, I played baseball, football, basketball. Uh, but every baseball season, uh, man, I'd get in crazy shape. Uh, and it's not because I had this crazy drive. It's because my coach had a crazy drive. And so he would just run me all the time. He's like, Billy, are you doing anything? I was like, no, we'll go run, right? It was like every day. So I, was run, I would run three or four miles a day in high school. And so I really started to enjoy running. Um, recently, I came across a book that just piqued my interest. It's called Born to Run. Um, and, and so I, I, I began to read this book, and the author of the book, uh, he, <clears throat> he, uh, his foot was hurting when he was running, and he asked the question, why does my foot hurt when I run? What, what's causing this pain? which led him on this journey, uh, and he ended up discovering this tribe in Mexico called the Tarahumara, uh, uh, this Tarahumara tribe. 
And, and, and the interesting thing about these, this group of people is that they would be in, or just run to one village 100 miles away, and then the next day they'd be spotted in another, in another area, another town 100 miles away, and then the next day, so on and so forth. They, they would run these insane distances. And so uh, race coordinators, people who are in charge of races, uh, they heard about this and, and they wanted to see how they did it, right? And so they had them run an ultra marathon, which those of you who don't know, an ultra marathon is like a lot of miles. It's a 100-mile run. It's ridiculous. I don't know why people do that. Um, but, but they were following them through this run, and at about mile 60, when most people start to shut down, start to hate them, themselves, hate their surroundings, uh, it was observed on these people's faces that they just had this huge smile on their face. They enjoyed uh, their circumstance. And the author, again, this isn't a Christian book, but the author said this quote, and it just, man, it sums up what we've been talking about this morning so well. And he says, the only way to conquer something is to love something. <clears throat> There's another book, I won't talk about it, but it, 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 it discusses uh, the, this, the, same, uh, the same idea, the same concept. This, this love has an effect on us. Love changes us, and, and love can also change others. There's a story uh, of this man and his son, and, 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 and uh, this is a Christian book. It was a man and his son, and, and, and the father, uh, well, the son hated to do math. He hated uh, his math homework. He, he, he was a good student. Otherwise, his other classes, he was doing well, but math was like the worst subject for him and so he started to struggle in math and and the dad wanting to uh help the son he started to uh set up all these rules so so uh make sure as soon as you get home you do your homework right and and so they were doing that and and, and what started to happen uh is over time the the son <clears throat> he, he 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 would stay at, stay at home trying to finish his homework he wasn't seeing his friends as often and then he, he wanted to see his friend, so he began lying to his dad. Dad, I, I, I don't want to do the homework. <laughs> uh, or, or dad, I'm sorry, I did the homework. I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. And, and he starts lying to his dad. Uh, after <clears throat> some time, the dad gets a call from the teacher telling him that his son had not turned in any homework. And at that point, the, t uh, the, the, the father was furious. And so, uh, so, so, the, so the rules went from you have to stay home uh, until you finish your homework. Two, you have to stay home until you are completed with your homework, and I check your homework, and only on the weekends can you go with your friends. And so this was a situation, this was a circumstance that the dad did not want to be in, that the son did not want to be in, and they were beginning to butt heads and to fight against each other. I want to read from here. It says, when I, so, so, so this, this man, he went to go get counseling, and, 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 and so the counselor's writing. He says, when I, Jim, suggested to Andy that he made sure Mitch felt love in the midst of all this, he was almost in disbelief. Are you kidding? He said. He knows I love him. Are you telling me Mitch should feel more loved when he's failing math? That'll just make him think it's okay, and it's not. I asked Andy if he had any other ideas about how to help Mitch feel more encouraged. After conceding that he tried everything else, he reluctantly agreed to somehow express his love to Mitch. Just be certain, I cautioned, that when you let him know you love him, you do it in a sincere way, not expecting or demanding a change in his behavior or he'll just feel manipulated. God loves us in the midst of any sin we commit or could commit. This draws us toward, not away from, his righteousness. So it's untrue that showing our children unconditional love somewhere reinforces negative behavior. We've repeatedly found that children's attitudes soften if parents emphasize their love when kids misbehave. So what's happening here is he, he's tried everything else. He doesn't know how to engage his son, and he has been given the advice to just love your son unconditionally. 
When I saw Andy, the story continues, when I saw Andy the following week, his eyes were bright. You wouldn't believe it, he said. The day we last talked, I prayed that God would help me to be more in tune with my love for Mitch during this whole math thing. That day after work, Mitch was in fine form. He threw every excuse in the book at me. I was getting frustrated, but then I caught myself. Instead of launching into him the way I normally do, I just waited and let him go on for a while and felt a new sense of compassion for him. Then it dawned on me, I really do love this little guy. He's my beloved son. I felt calm, which I hadn't felt in the middle of this before. Mitch, his son, could sense it too. The dad says, I relaxed and sat down on the stairs where he'd met me so that we were on the same level. I looked at him in the eyes and said, Mitch, doing well in math is important. But do you know what's far more important? I was kind of solemn. He shook his head not knowing what to expect. What's far more important is that you know how much I love you. And whether or not you're good or, good or not in math can't change that. Mitch's eyes filled with tears. He jumped into my arms and began to sob. I'm really sorry, Dad. I'm just not very good at math. It's okay, son, I said. I hugged him for a while, and then he asked if he wanted my help to get it done. He said he did. And while it was still hard for him, the resistant attitude was gone. He, que- uh, he asked questions and worked harder than ever. And I was less frustrated and became a much better teacher. As the week went on, I did less of the math, and Mitch did more. <clears throat> At the end of this, he says about his son, he is a different kid, and I have to admit, I am a different dad. Love has the ability to not only change uh, ourselves, but to ha- change those around us. Oftentimes, our less than ideal circumstances tend to be our most ideal circumstances to share the love of Jesus in. <clears throat> so, how do you do this? What can we do? I want to give us four quick steps, and then we'll call it a day. Um, well, five quick steps, and then we'll call it a day. Uh, but this will help us show uh, love in our circumstances. So the first is to love. We just talked about this. Love unconditionally. Love unconditionally. Right? Jesus loved. We are called to love. We've discussed that. The second thing I, I would like to encourage us to do is to write. To write about it. I did this with my sixth period class. But, but, but writing helps you to be able to think clearly. You'll be able to focus in on exactly what is starting to frustrate you. You'll be able to focus in on the things that are getting under your skin or the things that are making these situations less than ideal. As you write, you, you'll start to uncover all this stuff, but, but I would encourage you to write about it. The next one is to pray. Now, this should be obviously through everything, but I put it in this specific moment uh, in the list is because after we've write, uh, written about it, um, it would be good for us to sit down and, and think of how we can uh, and, and pray about how we can love in those situations, right? Specifically in those situations. The next is to understand. Now what this means is to understand that a positive experience isn't a guarantee, right? It's not, okay, if I'm going to start being nice to people, then my circumstances will change and everything's going to be hunky-dory. Is that right? Hunky-dory? It's it's going to go well and right and things are going to go smooth. That's not necessarily the case. We must be aware of that, but that should not be be our motivation. And then the last is to grow in godliness. We haven't talked about this, but in God's sovereignty, right, in God's sovereignty, and I can't even begin to understand the mind of God, but in God's sovereignty, 
he is using that circumstance, that image, <clears throat> I'm sorry, that circumstance to grow you in his image. Do not waste that opportunity. You know, I often tell myself in those situations that I, that I find myself in that I don't want to be in, man, that the Lord has me here right now. How is he using this moment to grow me into his image? At the end of our lives, guys, we are continually, for the, for the rest of our lives until we go see Jesus, we are continually, continually being formed, being shaped, being uh, transformed uh, into the image of Jesus. These less than ideal circumstances are part of that. Don't waste that opportunity. <clears throat> In my own efforts, with my sixth graders, I have begun this work. I have begun the work of, of loving these kids in a way that I initially didn't want to. Instead of pushing away, which I had been doing, I have decided to engage the students. I have asked them questions to get them to know about, uh, to get to know them about their lives. Right, I've given them handshakes. I've given them hugs. I've made it, uh, and I've get, have had this intentional effort to love them unconditionally. May we all look at all of our circumstances, and may we strive to love those in those. I'm sorry. And may we strive to love in those situations. Our less than ideal circumstances are often the most ideal circumstances to love like Jesus. Let's pray. <clears throat> Lord, thank you for uh, giving us life. Lord, thank you for um, creating us in your image, Lord. Thank you for just the opportunity to, to grow into your image. Lord, our, our, our circumstances are, are, are not easy. Some of them are, are very difficult, Lord. I pray that in our difficult moments, I pray that in our dirt, difficult circumstances, Lord, I pray that, that we look to you and come to you, come before you, and, 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 and learn how we can love in those situations, Lord. L loving is hard, and, and we like to do it when it's easy, Lord, but I pray that you just give us the wisdom, give us the strength to love even when we don't feel like it, Lord. Praise the name, praise the name. Amen. <clears throat> We're now going to continue in worship with communion. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink of it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. I'd like to invite those who are going to serve communion up. And, and as we are taking uh, communion this morning, <clears throat> we do so, and Scripture calls us, we do so remembering what Christ has done. Right, this is a picture of Christ entering a less than ideal circumstance and loving us through it. May we remember that. Remember Christ's work as we, uh, as we partake of communion. Now, I'd like to invite you guys to come to the table. You don't, do not have to come based on membership of River Church. It's, it's not about membership, what, what allows people to take communion. It's about relationship. 
with Jesus. So if you believe in Jesus, if you are a Christian, been a Christian for 20 years, could have been a Christian for 20 minutes, if you believe in Jesus and what he has done, I invite you to the table. I invite you to come, to come and eat. It is good for you.